when you're on your own, there's a lot of stress. You're constantly responsible for everything, for every decision you make. If you're not truly passionate about the thing you're working on, you're going to lose steam pretty fast. Once you find that connection, it becomes a very strong motivation for you to not only grow as a developer, but also grow as a person because it gives you a sense of purpose. Developers imagine open source visionaries toiling away at a laptop all day like a mad scientist. But practically, what does the daily routine look like for a full-time open source creator like yourself? One perk of being an independent open source developer is that you get a lot of freedom of deciding what to do each day. But a typical day does involve sitting in front of a computer and writing a lot of code. The sheer amount of issues coming in means there's always work to do, but it's Usually important to start the day with some planning, thinking about do I want to spend the day just dealing with issues or do I want to work on some more research or explorative work? Usually it just starts with the day with some light planning. And once I decide what to do, I try to stick to the plan for that day. But if it's say an issue triaging day, then it does involve just sitting in front of a computer and fixing bugs, running code. I try to spend reasonable amount of time with family as much as I can. I would say like the normal day starts with sending the kids to school, then sitting in front of the computers. During lunchtime, I usually just have lunch with my wife, relax, and then sit in front of the computer in the afternoon again. I would say the routine is pretty stable because uh, even though I work for myself, it's good to have some sort of rhythm you can repeat. Otherwise, it's easy to fall into a state where you really don't know what to do. So self-discipline and some sort of planning is really important if you're working for yourself. Many people are inspired by you and your work, but who and what inspires you? In the early days, I think a lot of these open source pioneers and the Node.js ecosystem really set me up on the journey. Substack, TJ Holloway, Chuck, and other great open source developers like Taylor Otwell, who worked on Laravel. So a lot of these people essentially showed me that, oh, like doing open source can have a really big impact on the people's work and even life. That was a big inspiration in the early days. When I decided to start doing open source full time myself, I looked to a lot of indie hacker style people for inspiration because I was mostly trying to figure out how can I make it sustainable? How can I actually make a living by working on the open source? So Tim Ferriss, who's the author of the four hour work week was a pretty big inspiration in terms of figuring out how to generate a passive income stream so that you can focus on doing what you love. I didn't really follow the book word by word, but that book really kind of opened up the perspective for me and showed me what is possible as an independent creator. If someone wanted to follow in your shoes and become a full-time open source creator, what advice would you give to them? Two things. First is you need to really be passionate about the thing you work on because there will be a lot of pressure when you try to make a living by doing a thing completely on your own. Compared to working for an employer, there's the safety net of knowing someone's going to pay you every two weeks. But when you're on your own, there's a lot of stress. You're constantly responsible for everything, for every decision you make. If you're not truly passionate about the thing you're working on, you're going to lose steam pretty fast. The other side of it is if you can try to focus on building something that can bring you continuous long-term passive income. See, if you're always trading your time for money, then it's going to always be an uphill battle. So you want to spend your time to create things that can give you return over time for a relatively longer period of time. This way, when you keep at it for long enough, you build up a passive income stream that can continue to support you for years to come. When you encounter challenges or seemingly insurmountable problems, what are the ways that you work through that and break them apart? Originally, my answer would be try to break up a big complex problem into smaller steps that feel more manageable. It's hard to come up with a universal set of rules on how to do that, but usually it involves a lot of 
talking to myself, really. Like when I'm faced with a problem that I just don't have an immediate idea how to solve it, I try to just walk around the room and talk to myself. It's almost like the rubber duck debugging technique, right? Uh, you need to sort of put yourself in another person's shoe and start asking yourself questions. You know, just try to look at the problem from a different perspective. And then try to chip away until you find that first thing that you think is manageable and then start focusing on something so that you start making progress that gives you confidence. To be honest, I think the, the, the process that I follow is kind of intuition driven in a way. Usually, if I feel like a problem is solvable, even before I know the answer, I always kind of have a gut feeling like this is probably doable, this is probably not. So if it's doable, then I will start thinking about how to dissect it into more concrete, small tasks. And then start with the lowest hanging fruit that gives me confidence to, to keep tackling the other problems. But there are also cases where, like in the beginning, I thought it was possible. But then when I start working with the first step, I realize, oh, this is much more complex than it looked to be. That happens too. I think the important thing is you always got to find the first step to actually get into it, try to do it, try to work on it. That gives you more insight than just thinking, you know, out of the blue. What is the next game-changing tool or idea that you're working on? Sometimes there are such ideas, but to be honest, at this very moment, there are a lot of work to be done in Vue itself. So for the foreseeable future, my main focus will still be on Vue and Beat. In fact, probably more on Vue at this stage because we have a lot of things planned for Vue. There are features lined up for the next few minor releases and there's Vapor Mode, which is also a big undertaking. So I think for at least a year or two, the main focus will still be on Vue. When you sit down to write a component with the Composition API, what is your general design approach for crafting a component with elegance in terms of readability and reusability? I would say I'm more of the iterative type, especially for application code. I think it's relatively difficult to just sit there and then plan ahead perfectly. You need to just get the code flowing, then you can start to get a feel of how it looks like. I would describe my process of working on most code more like a sculpture-like process. I would try to get something working as fast as possible and then start thinking about how to make it look good. I think it's difficult to think about elegance before you even get something working, right? So I always think of it as an iterative approach. And then once you've got something working and you start refactoring, I think it's also a good practice to have some tests so that you gain confidence when you're moving things around, you know the tests are always passing. That allows you to start thinking about, oh, like maybe restructure these, extracting your reusable composables. Once I get all the boxes ticked feature-wise, I try to refactor the code into something that reads naturally, flows naturally. Especially with the Composition API, I think it's possible to make your component code read like it's describing itself. You know, use this feature, use that feature, then you combine everything together. Extracting them into composables, and each composable essentially describing what it does. And when you read that one by one, it feels like the component is describing what it does by itself. What is your recommended minimalist toolchain for a solo developer working alone? What are the top tools that you consider essential to your workflow? I would say this is a highly personal thing. So I can only offer like what I personally prefer. I would say an IDE editor that suits you. But if you're working with Vue, obviously VS Code is probably the obvious choice. An, a terminal that is no fluff, pretty much. I just use iTerm2. And then I also use Raycast on my Mac to quickly get to the commonly used things. It's just so much better than the built-in spotlight search. Other than that, to be honest, I think my setup is super minimal. Like I just use a terminal editor and Chrome for its dev tools. And that's pretty much it. Developers appear to be excited about view macros like define model, but are simultaneously cautious about using an experimental feature that may go away. What would you say to someone considering using define model in their projects? So the only risk of using an experimental feature in production is in the likely case where it gets dropped, you'll need to refactor out of it. That's really the only risk. We will never suddenly one day 
say in a patch release just remove a feature and break your app in production that's not going to happen right we're always going to communicate way ahead of time if we ever decide to drop an experimental feature and considering all the experimental features that we have shipped and eventually removed the only case that's ever happened was with reactivity transform that's a feature that has been controversial since day one thinking about other experiment features like script setup I'm not sure how many people remember it was an experimental feature when it first came out, but people loved it, so it naturally just became a stable feature. So not all experimental features are equal, so the sentiment when you're reading the RFC, you can sort of use that as an indication of how likely it becomes a stable feature. That's also what we kind of use to gauge an experimental feature means that there's a high likelihood that the API may change and a very low likelihood that it may get removed. So if the API changes, it's a relatively small risk because it's going to be just some minor refactoring. So if it gets dropped, it means you will have to refactor out of it. So when you're often into it, you need to make sure you're okay with that risk. It's not like end of the world, but realistically, you just need to be prepared. In case this happens, I'm okay with the risk. It really has to be your own decision on whether you're okay with that, right? If you are completely not okay with having to refactor out of a feature, then just don't use them. But if you feel like the DX improvement is so great and you, when you read the RFC, you feel like the sentiment is very positive, you're very sure that this is likely going to end up as stable, then by all means, go for it. But again, I think like personally for me, if I were a user and I see an experimental feature that I like a lot, I'm just going to use it because I am okay with the potential cost of having to refactor out of it. And usually the cost of refactoring is not that much. I always say things like reactivity transform was a probably more involved one. In fact, we shipped a small tool that can help you automatically convert your code from reactivity transform back to the vanilla composition API. So in those cases, we do try to help you with the refactoring as well. Is there a possibility in the roadmap of Vue for the creation of a dedicated mobile solution? So in terms of a native solution for Vue like React Native, I get asked about this quite often. The answer is the Vue team does not have a plan to work on a first party native solution, mostly because of the bandwidth, the resource it requires to work on such a solution is huge. So if you think about React Native, so React core team is maybe like a dozen developers at Meta, but React Native is like a few times bigger than the React core team. The Vue team don't really have that kind of resource to maintain such a large team to work on a full on native solution like that. So it's unlikely to see a first party solution, but there are reasonable alternatives, say native script view. I think they published a Vue 3 compatible version of Vue native script, which is currently in beta. If you're interested in solutions like that, you should check it out. Alternatively, if your app is relatively simple, then Ionic View is also a good solution if you just need to get something out really quickly. What is your vision for View 4? Are there lessons learned from the View 3 transition that you will take forward with you? The lesson learned from the View 3 transition is we definitely brought about more disruption and more breaking changes than we intended with the transition. I think the biggest oversight was that we underestimated the impact of these breaking changes on third-party dependencies. Right, so we were mostly focused on first-party user code. When we were evaluating the impact of those breaking changes, we felt that was reasonable from a migration perspective. But in reality, we noticed that most users who had difficulty upgrading were blocked by third-party dependencies. So that was definitely a good lesson for us to keep in mind for future upgrades. Luckily for now, in terms of the future version for say Vue 4, we don't foresee any reason to do major breaking changes like Vue 2 to Vue 3 for the foreseeable future. In fact, our focus, even for the next major version, we foresee the changes to be more like say Angular 2 to Angular 3. Small breaking changes that you can easily upgrade to. There will be no major migration efforts required. We'll probably try to follow the rhythm of deprecate something, then remove it in the next major version. The next major versions, which we don't actually have a plan for major versions now, but even if it comes in terms of scope, it will be more like Angular 3, Angular 4, Angular 5. 
in that kind of sense. We want to make sure that all current V3 code bases can upgrade with minimal effort so that the ecosystem can move forward. Unlike the current V2 to V3 situation, we know a lot of users are kind of stuck on V2, which is why we brought 2.7 so that they can benefit from some of the new features that we offered in V3. Other than that, you can probably tell from, say, the biggest new thing that's coming vapor mode, our primary focus is also to make it incrementally adoptable, right? So the focus vapor mode is, despite it being a completely different rendering mechanism underneath, you want first the API, the template syntax will be exactly the same. So there's nothing to change from a user perspective. And second is adoption wise, you can opt in at the component level, so you can start moving part of an app to vapor mode without affecting anything that's already running. Will keep stability a first priority for the future development of view.